Welcome to the new episode of Russia on the Record, the new podcast from the Moscow Times. In this episode, we will discuss the changes that have occurred in the Russian economy since February 2022 how the economy is adapting to wartime challenges, the true damage of sanctions, and which economic partners Russia can count on today. Our guest today is business and economics reporter Jake Cordell. At the beginning of the war, the Russian economy was predicted to collapse quickly, but so far it is holding up. What were those estimates based on why has the Russian economy proved to be so resilient, Jake? Yeah, that's very true. And it's something that Vladimir Putin and other officials in Moscow make a habit of reminding the world about and reminding the Russian people about that the West was unable to destroy the Russian economy, as many Western officials predicted. I think we have to look, go back to those predictions to understand why they didn't materialize. And part of it is because there was really nothing to work with to make those predictions on. It was very, very much a guessing game. You know, that that kind of situation, you know, a modern day invasion of, of a neighbor and then the imposition of really strict Western sanctions with an economy that was so integrated with the global economy had really never been done before. So it was a lot of guesswork going on. But you have to give... I don't know if credit is the right word, but you have to recognize that the, the way Russia responded did alleviate some of that pain. And I think it went through three stages. So first of all, you had the immediate response, and that was led by the central bank. That was the emergency hike in interest rates and really strict capital controls to stop people converting all their money into dollars or euros and sending it out of Russia. And that stopped the kind of immediate financial crisis. Then they moved into the short term. And the short term, Russia was was really a benefit of some sky high energy prices, in particular oil and gas. And this was in sort of April, May, June last year, when they were at one point making like over a billion euros or dollars a day by selling their energy and oil. This was before the European sanctions had come into effect that stopped Europe buying most of Russia's oil and almost all of Russia's gas. They benefited from that in the short term. And now, as we're 18 months after after the start, after the imposition of sanctions, uh, after Russia launched its military campaign on Ukraine, the Russian economy itself has been transformed into a much more of a militarized economy. It's been put on a much more of a war footing. And with that, there's been a massive ramp up in government spending, which has compensated for the fall in exports. And now the economy is much, much, much more reliant on the government itself to spend, to support the economy, to support economic growth. So in a way, it's kind of artificial because it's, the government itself is is dictating how much the economy grows and slows down. But I think that that's the, the stages we've been through, and that's why the economy has proved on the surface to not have been destroyed or collapsed by Western sanctions. Based on the results of the first half of the year, Russia's GDP grew by 1.6%. So what is driving this growth? You probably mentioned already the reason, but is it like with this military production? Yeah, that's definitely a really big part of it is military production. And we, when we think of military production, we think of the, the billions of dollars being poured into producing artillery shells, tanks, missiles, that kind of stuff. That's definitely taking a big part of it. But we also need to broaden what we think of military spending as well, because part of it is the spending on soldiers' wages and stuff. So And compensation for soldiers that have died. And lots of that is then being put back into the economy through consumer spending. You know, there's these people that are being offered four, five, six times the salaries they were earning before. They're going out and spending that or their families are spending that while, while they're at the front in Ukraine. So that's supporting the economy. And you have to look at that also as a kind of military spending because this money wouldn't exist were it not for the for, for Russia's what it calls its special military operation. You're also seeing a big increase in things like construction. And that's being led by two fronts. First of all, it's actually defensive construction in places like Crimea is really ramped up. And we see in Crimea, construction nearly doubled year on year compared to the year before because of spending on on the military campaign but it's also things like house building and Russia at the moment is running like a really big um, mortgage subsidy program basically offering lots of Russians really cheap mortgages if they buy new apartments and so that's giving Russians cheap access to credit they're buying new houses and the construction industry is building ferociously at the moment so Again, you have to ask, would that program be in place if it wasn't for the military campaign? Uh, it's unclear. It was introduced during coronavirus, but they kept it going as a way to keep people happy despite some other economic headwinds. So there's wider areas connected to, to the military campaign that are driving this growth. 
Can we say that Russia is now living in a war economy? I think more more and more. If you look at what, what a wartime economy is, it's a lot of spending of GDP being directed towards the military. I mean, some estimates are saying that if you include everything connected with the campaign, you know, from the soldier salaries to building tanks to building missiles to everything, including like the reconstruction efforts in occupied territories and stuff, you might be getting to a figure around 9-10% of Russia's GDP, which is being driven by the military campaign. Now, that's three, four times what military spending was before. So you can really see from that how fast Russia has ramped up its economy. On the other hand, if you're living in Moscow, you're living in St. Petersburg, it probably really doesn't feel like you're living in a wartime economy. You're walking around these streets. You can easily avoid the the war if if you're living in, in these big cities. And you still go to restaurants, shops are still opening, some Western brands are still available, or they've been replaced by Russian alternatives. It probably really doesn't feel like that. But one of the aspects of how Russia's economy has changed over the last 18 months is almost a big redistribution away from those consumer hubs like St. Petersburg and Moscow, where it's lots of people engaged in private industry, you know, highly educated liberal workers that were more open to international companies, perhaps they were working for. And the exodus of Western companies, plus widespread emigration, which has been driven by the richest people, you know, people that can afford to live abroad for for a period of time, and towards places, much poorer places in the south of Russia, in in some of the ethnic republic uh, areas, where, as we see from the figures on the number of soldiers who have been killed and who have been called up, they are disproportionately providing soldiers to support Russia's military campaign. And as a result, they are also disproportionately benefiting from the payments and the wartime economy that's been put into existence in the form of higher salary payments and also all the all the factories that are producing artillery shells and tanks. They're not located in Moscow and St. Petersburg. They're located out in the Urals or in the surrounding areas. So they're the places that are really feeling the benefit of this economic growth. So while it may not feel like there's a wartime economy at the moment, the dynamics suggest it is definitely heading in that direction and it's heading in places that people in Moscow and St. Petersburg probably aren't seeing. In general, what does the military economy look like? But do you think officials are refraining from completely putting the country on a war footing? Yeah, that's right. And I think that may be because of fears of potentially some sort of political retribution or protests. And like we said, if you're living in a big city, it probably doesn't feel like there's a war footing. But if if you think about it, the military economy is just a, a country where the government and the demand for military production, military equipment, basically destructive weapons that don't really add any value to an economy beyond being rolled off a production line and then, in this case, fired at Ukraine or destroyed in, in, in Ukraine that doesn't really add any value to the Russian economy. And that's definitely the way that the Russian economy is heading. And, you know, the problem is this stores up much long-term problems. So we talked about the short-term resilience, but the longer you put your economy on a on a military footing, the harder it is to unwind and the longer the problems that, you know, the opportunity costs, as economists call it, build up. So, you know, for every 200 tanks you build per year, that means you can't build however many new hospitals maybe a new road or a new railway connection or a new school. And that's the kind of investments that make people richer, make countries richer, make economies stronger and better over the longer term. So the more Russia directs resources in this way, the more it neglects those areas that it's going to be the future of its economic success. And then it becomes a vicious cycle because it's so you need to spend on the military to support your economy. You can't just cancel these billions and billions of dollars and billions and billions of rubles that you poured into military factories. It's it's much easier to militarize the economy than demilitarize it. And so in a way, almost the longer the war goes on, the, the much harder it's going to be for Russia to, if it if whoever's in power decides they even want to, to return to a more civilian-based economy. Foreign immigrants who worked in the construction and other sectors of our economy contributed a lot into Russian economic growth. Is Russia still an attractive place for foreign labor immigrants from ex-Soviet republics? It's definitely the case that the Russian labor market isn't as attractive as it was even three or four years ago for Central Asian migrants who, by any accounts, you know, the the minimum number of Central Asian migrants in the Russian economy is around three, three and a half million by official statistics. It's probably a lot more once you factor in illegal migration, black economy employment, plus lots of what 
Central Asian migrants came to Russia a few years ago. Now they've got Russian citizenships. So they don't count as labor migrants, but by all intents and purposes, they still are. They're still sending money back home to their families. So definitely sectors of the Russian economy are still very reliant. It's been particularly construction, agriculture, the kind of low skill parts of the Russian economy, you know, careers, taxi drivers, that kind of thing. In terms of whether they're leaving Russia because of either two factors, one of them is the falling ruble. So they literally have less money to send back home every single month, or because they are being encouraged, asked, pushed to certain degrees to sign up for some kind of military-related work, whether that's actually being asked to fight and serve in Russia's armed forces or being asked to go and work on some, on, you know, the reconstruction of Mariupol or something, which is something that many of them obviously don't want to do. So Russia is becoming less attractive from that terms. It's tricky to pin down how much of an exodus is going on at the moment, though, because the fact is that Despite all of this, Russia is still more attractive than uh, working in Tashkent, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan uh, for many of these of these labor migrants. And if we take Uzbekistan, which provides the most labor migrants to Russia every year, uh, every single year, almost half a million young people enter the labor force and their 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 economy is very young and the economy can't produce enough jobs for them. So they've got to go somewhere. And for now, Russia is still the easiest place to go because of cultural, linguistic, bureaucratic links. If other countries and other destinations were to become easier to to go to, whether that's South Korea, Japan, or the Middle East, or even Europe or America, then you probably would see many of them think, well, why would I go to Russia when I have these other opportunities? But for now, there probably aren't that many other opportunities out there for them. You mentioned that ruble has fallen now, but actually the Russian currency demonstrated stability at the beginning of the of the year. Since the end of the summer, that it has started to lose its value. What's the reason? Yeah, this is a big topic of discussion now amongst Russia watchers, Russian economists, pinning down the the exact minutiae in any kind of week or day as to why the Russian ruble is falling now it is, is pretty tricky and a bit of a black box. But we know the general trends. The general trends are that Russia's current account balance, that's basically the difference between its exports and its imports, which is basically, like if we get down to a really basic level, is about supply and demand for Russian currency. If Russia is exporting lots, there lots of demand for Russian currency. People need to buy Russian currency to trade with, with Russia or or people that sell in dollars then need to transfer it into Russian rubles to spend it at home. So last year, this balance was positive $230 billion. So $230 dollars billion more flew into the Russian economy and was transferred into rubles than left. This year, it's going to be about 30, 40, 50, something like that. So four four times less than it was last year. So there's been a four times less demand for for rubles than there were last year, for instance. And a lot of that is to do with the delayed impact of things like the oil price cap and energy measures that mean that the West is no longer buying as much Russian oil and gas uh, as it was. Now, paradoxically, there's on Russian you know, social media, you'll see a lot of almost conspiracy theories that the Russian government actually likes a weaker ruble. And that's because if Russia is selling its oil and gas, which is its main export, it, in, in dollars, even though if it's not selling it in dollars, the price they get for it is benchmarked in dollars. That means that a weaker ruble, they literally get more rubles for every dollar, every barrel of oil they sell. And if we consider we were talking about the wartime economy, if the question for the Russian government now is, how many like tanks or missiles can we build with this many barrels of oil or how many barrels of oil do we need to sell to build a million artillery shells then a weaker ruble is much better for that you know the, the price of russia's oil in rubles has doubled this year since the start of the year so there are some short-term benefits now eventually prices catch up and it doesn't quite work as simple as that. But there are definitely some short-term benefits for the Russian government if we look at its priorities today and its priorities are clearly the military campaign in Ukraine and not really people's welfare or the wider economy, then yeah, there are some benefits to a weaker ruble. Officially, annual inflation in Russia is estimated at less than 6%, but based on my impressions, the prices have risen faster than that. Where do these numbers come from and are there any real calculations on the inflation in Russia? Yeah, sure. I think this is a factor like 
all around the world, all, all kind of economies, people always say that prices are rising faster than the official statistics. And there's some truth to that. And there's some kind of subjective feeling to that. I suppose the truth is that generally the lower down the income scale, not low earning, just lower down compared to rich earners, inflation is actually higher for you because the goods you're buying are much more sensitive to price rises. You know, much more of your income going on food, accommodation, uh, utilities, if you have a car going on petrol, gas, and they're the things that rise fastest in prices in periods of fluctuation. So there is some truth that inflation is higher the lower down the income scale you are. And then there's the subjective feeling for that. So inflation now is only, I think, around five and a half, six percent on an annual basis, but people don't really live their lives by year on year comparisons. They live their lives on this feeling. And the feeling has been that a year before inflation was 14, 15%. And then the year before that, it was 7 or 8%. So if you look back over a period of two or three years, prices have gone up by almost a third. So that's the kind of thing that, that people feel. And then they obviously look at the headline figure of 6% and think, well, that can't be right. Like, and as I said, it might be right technically, but on a subjective level, it's not quite that. And also the other factor is not only the prices you're paying, but the quality of goods that you're getting. And, and in Russia now, that's a big issue because especially with the departure of lots of Western companies, you know, the way inflation is measured is they measure the price of like a TV. Now, the TV you got a year ago might well have been better quality than the TV you get this year because of the fact that your favorite TV maker no longer sells in Russia. So you've got to compromise and get a different brand. That might not get picked up in inflation. You know, whether you think the big hit from Fusne Toshka is worth as much as a Big Mac was from McDonald's, like again, that might not get picked up in inflation. So it's that that kind of subjective feeling is also not really measured, but something that people derive their their opinions and their behaviors on. Russia has raised interest rates very quickly over the summer. We've noticed it. So why is that? Why it happened? And will it work to bring down inflation and stabilize the ruble? So the reason they've done it is because of that feeling, like you said, about inflation, that even though inflation may be low, it is rising quite fast. And typically it shouldn't really be rising over the summer, actually, because normally you have food and fruit prices and vegetable prices should go down in the summer, really. But actually they've been rising in Russia, which is a bit of an issue, a cause of concern. And they're worried that the falling ruble, which has fallen, when, it, especially when it passed through 100 against the dollar, that's going to come through to inflation in the next few months. So they're really worried about that. And they've responded by the first interest rate rises since I think the 27th or 28th of February last year. So straight after the start of the war is when this is the first time they've raised interest rates. I think, will it work is a big question. I mean, there's traditionally, the way traditionally interest rates rise is because it makes borrowing more expensive. So it stops businesses and people from demanding money and it means they're going to save more and therefore it should bring prices down. But will that work in Russia today? There are some big doubts, two key reasons why. One of them is that because the economy is so militarized, prices don't really matter. The, the Russian government is the biggest client. The Russian government isn't thinking like, oh, it's now costing me like three, four, five percent more to build this rocket, to build this artillery shell. They're not going to say, okay, just build one million instead of two million. You know, they're going to build as many as they need to fire at Ukraine. And they're not going to be dictated by price. So that doesn't really matter that that demand isn't being destroyed in the way that it would work traditionally. And secondary as well, we talked earlier about this possible like mortgage boom and this construction boom because of this subsidized program. So that's still in place. So you can raise interest rates as much as you want. But if the amount that you, people are borrowing to buy a new home, which is probably their most significant monthly outlay doesn't change, then they're not going to change their spending habits. You know, in the in the West, they raised interest rates and people are really worried, I can't afford my mortgage payments, I have to cut back spending elsewhere. That's exactly how interest rate rises are supposed to happen and supposed to work. But in Russia, it doesn't work like that. And this again comes back to the idea that the economy is much more connected to the state and the state doesn't really respond to interest rate rises in the way that it would. So what economists call the transmission mechanism, the way that interest rate rises affect the wider economy and inflict inflation, probably don't work in the same traditional way. And it might take a bit longer, it might take more severe action to actually work. Also, unemployment is at record lows right now, and uh, Putin and the Kremlin say it is a good thing, but is it actually the case? Yeah, and this is also part of the, the inflation story, that unemployment is, at, I think, 3% at the moment, which is the lowest it's ever been in Russian history. And that might sound really good, everyone has jobs, which is obviously part of the story, but 
actually the bigger part of the story is that loads of parts of the Russian economy are facing labor shortages. They can't get enough workers. In the construction industry, for instance, they say they could hire 200,000 more people to feed demand, but they can't because they're working. And that's because of mobilization and war. You know, last year alone, 300,000 people, young men, workers, often engineers, construction, drivers were called up to the armed forces. So they were literally taken out of their workplace. Plus, we've had depending on estimates, anywhere from four or 500,000 up to a million Russians have left since February last year. So they're also being taken out of the labor force. And that's leaving parts of the non-military part of the economy really starved of workers, even right down from, from restaurants and cafes in Moscow and St. Petersburg, because young people uh, have either left or they can get much better wages working in some part of the economy connected to the military. That doesn't necessarily mean going to fight, but maybe working for a factory or just even just, you know, driving trucks around for, for companies producing military goods, for instance. And again, that creates long-term problems because of your redirecting resources away from productive parts of the economy that add value and you're putting them into parts of the economy where the whole purpose is just to produce something that's going to be destroyed and fired into the ground. That doesn't add anything to your economy. Plus, the people that have emigrated, who are they? They're professionals. Many of them were working in foreign companies from cities. They were generally richer. So this effect of these people leaving the labor market has been, has, will be felt much more severe over the long term as these highly qualified people are no longer contributing to the Russian economy. Okay, let's come back to the sanctions. Which sectors of the economy felt the impact of sanctions the most? I think that immediately when we're talking about sanctions, we also have to, I suppose, combine everything, not just sanctions, but also the response of Western companies who left Russia. That was kind of an indirect part of sanctions. They weren't told to leave, but they just couldn't get paid anymore. They couldn't do get insured anymore and all that kind of stuff. Plus how Russia has responded by basically telling Western companies you're no longer welcome, seizing their assets and stuff like that. So if we take that all together, I mean, the, the one industry that stands out as the most hardest hit is Russia's car making sector, which was really strong uh, before the, the start of the military campaign and uh, had had a lot of investment from Western companies, employed lots of people in high school work. But last year, for instance, Russia produced fewer cars than in any year since the end of the Soviet Union. We had car makers producing cars without airbags for a few weeks because they couldn't get supplies and the industry has been really just hit and and that shows up in in places in Russia which are big car making areas so Kaliningrad Kaluga where there were really big factories they're suffering some of the, the sharpest uh, slowdowns in GDP since since February last year also energy you know energy has energy is probably the biggest direct hit from sanctions and in particular gas so gas production was down more than 10 percent last year Gazprom is now running at a loss which is quite incredible when you think about where global gas prices are and how just how profitable you know Gazprom has been like a real cash cow for, for the Russian economy for, for, for years for decades really since since Putin came to power in the early 2000s and now it's losing money and that's obviously an impact of Europe stopping buying gas. And then I think you've got the long-term problems are mainly anything that relies on high tech. I mean, even the central bank has said that for now, Russia is dealing with this technological challenge of loss of microchips and all this kind of stuff. But they say it's just going to get worse over time. So yeah, the more, more industry-related stuff has been hit hard now, but over the long term, it's definitely going to be the more knowledge and technology-based parts of the economy. And are there any estimations which category of Russians has felt the impact of sanctions the most? Yeah, I think it's probably fair to say the Russians that have felt the impact of sanctions or I would say not just sanctions, but the, the whole economic kind of crisis and transformation of the past 18 months has definitely been the urban middle classes. The kind of, I so suppose, the people that maybe like Dmitry Medvedev, when he was president for a few years, tried to court kind of technologists, private businesses, managers. And they were higher up on the income scale so they can weather it better. But they're the people who were taking lots of foreign trips, who were buying lots of Western goods and, as I say, living in Moscow and St. Petersburg, which hasn't had the kind of economic benefits of the government's investment in the military campaign. So they've definitely been the biggest losers, although obviously it's relative because they were doing much better to begin with. So, you know, I don't think you find many people that say they're like hard pressed, but definitely the people working in you know, marketing and advertising or managing or tech, private technology companies, they're the ones who are still having the pay cuts that were introduced 
straight after the start of the war, they're still in place, they're still earning less than they were before. Whereas in many other parts of the economy and in many other rural centers, especially those ones where there's big military factories, for instance, they're doing better, maybe even better than ever as a result of Russia's militarization of the economy. But are there already estimates on the damage of the Russian economy from sanctions or it's hard to do any estimations right now? It's hard to say exactly what the impact of sanctions has been alone. But again, if we talk about the, the wider economic crisis, there's a few ways of looking at it. You can look just at the numbers. So last year, the economy dropped by 2%. So, you know, some people say, oh, it means the economic hit was only 2%. But probably it's worth looking at what Russia was meant to do before It started its campaign against Ukraine, so it was meant to grow by maybe four, four and a half, maybe even five percent last year. So if you think about it like that, that's actually a six or seven percent hit to GDP, which is quite significant in that terms. That's probably one of the simplest ways of looking at the cost of sanctions. The long term, we're already starting to get some estimates. So the what economists call the like long term growth capacity of the economy, which is basically if everything is good or everything stays as it is now, how quickly can an economy grow? And at the moment, Russia's potential is like 1%, which is is really, really low. And you can see it wouldn't take much to push that into negative territory. Before, like two years ago, it would probably have been two, two and a half percent. If you take it back even further to before the annexation of Crimea, it was probably three, three and a half percent. So you can see compounded how Russia is now going to grow 1% a year compared to maybe 3% a year, how every single year it falls further and further behind what it what it could be. So yeah, while the economy hasn't been destroyed, over the long term, you can really see how much the economy is and will kind of suffer uh, as a result, not only of sanctions, but probably moreover of Russia's response to sanctions and the economic policies it introduced uh, in response to, to, to what the West did. Yeah, we see that the EU and the US uh, regularly prepare new packages of sanctions, but Russia continues to find ways to circumvent these sanctions. It turns out that it is impossible to completely isolate the Russian economy from the outside world. Will it always be possible for Russia to circumvent sanctions? Yeah, I think there's obviously two categories of sanctions circumvention. There's the legal and the illegal kind of sanctions evasion and we're talking about like you know Russia buying technology from other companies that have legally imported it that's hard to ban and then there's the illegal stuff of like smuggling goods into Russia I mean there's always going to be creative middlemen who come up with schemes to make money in these countries you know there's like I've seen the reports about Russia buying record numbers of washing machines from Armenia to get the microchips and stuff like it's quite expensive buying a whole washing machine to get a microchip but there's always going to be a way to, to get what you want And I think this probably depends not on Russia. If there are middlemen, Russia's always going to find them. It depends more on what kind of pressure the US and the EU put on these countries, especially in the EU, which needs unanimous approval from all the members to keep sanctions in place. So if political will wanes or they don't have the resources to enforce sanctions or to, in particular, you know, put pressure on those kind of countries like Turkey or India, UAE, maybe even China to say, we're really going to come after your companies if you start sending and selling goods to Russia to replace imports. And, you know, if they were wanting to get really strict, they could, of course, target Western companies themselves and say, well, we see you're sell selling three times as many of this product to Kazakhstan as you were three years ago. Like, can you explain that? That, that would be a really strict approach, but of course, we don't really see anything like that happening now. So probably the long term answer to that is, is how the West responds and how strict it really wants to be. Russia will always search and find people that it can do business with. I suppose the West's job, as it sees it, is to restrict and make it absolutely clear the risks involved of doing any kind of business with Russia that involves sanctioned goods, even if those entities themselves aren't directly sanctioned. Speaking about business with Russia, who are Russia's most reliable economic partners now? Ex-Soviet republics or BRICS countries, some other countries? I think those are the clear two categories. Ex-Soviet republics are important, but they're not really, there's no real economic powerhouse there. So they're not really so important in terms of economic contribution, but as a sanction circumvention route, like they're probably the most obvious. I mean, China is the, absolutely the main partner for Russia now. Trade is up 30 or 40 percent compared to where it was before the invasion. I think it's more than double what it was before the coronavirus pandemic. But 
it's a much more transactional relationship than Russia had with the West. And I think this is important to mention that the Russia's relationship with the West was about investment, partnerships. The West would send specialists, it would create companies in Russia, it would share technology, it would build factories, pipelines, oil rigs, it would do lots of joint investing with Russian companies and pouring money in in the shape of foreign direct investment. China, India, just don't really want that kind of relationship with Russia. They want just a trading relationship. They want to get cheap Russian energy. They want a new market for their export goods. Uh, so while it's helping Russia get products and find an outlet for its market, it's really not the kind of thing that's going to lead to long-term economic growth or investment in Russia. Uh, you know, as soon as there's an economic downturn in China or India, for instance, which, you know, in China, there's already signs of it, they're going to cut their supplies. They're going to cut their, their purchases of Russian oil because they don't need it so much. You know, China in particular doesn't want to become too dependent on one energy supplier. And there's signs that maybe they've already reached the limit of how much energy they can buy from Russia. So it's definitely not the same kind of partnership. And it is much more one directional. Russia is much more dependent on China than China is on Russia, which creates political and economic potential concerns further down the line. The Russian economy is becoming more and more dependent on China because China is becoming its main economic trade partner, right? I think that's true. It's definitely become much more dependent as an outlet for its energy. You know, if, if China hadn't massively increased its purchases of Russian oil and gas, we might be talking about something closer to those forecasts about, you know, 10, 11, 12 percent GDP decline in Russia. But because it was so easily able to reorientate its exports, then that's a clear benefit for the Russian economy from Moscow's point of view. But the thing with that kind of relationship is it can unwind as quickly as it was put into place if, if China decides it no longer wants to make those purchases or if sanctions become much tougher in place against Russian oil exports. Can Russia find any new economic partners like in Africa or some other Asian countries you see as potential new partners? We can see, obviously, Russia is courting Africa quite heavily. It had Putin gave a lot of time and attention to the Africa summit uh, hosted in St. Petersburg uh, a few months ago and definitely sees countries like South Africa uh, as partners. But again, the problem is that no one in these countries has the kind of economic might of China or India or the US or Europe had before. The kind of things that these countries can offer is nowhere near the same that the West or even China, India could offer. They don't have technology to share with Russia. They don't have a pool of highly qualified specialists ready to come in and, and add something to the Russian economy. It's much more Russia looking for just ways to make money. So, And it's almost like Russia would be pouring the technology into these countries. You know, we see Russia making a big push in terms of its atomic energy. It's opened atomic energy station in, in Turkey, for instance, quite recently, a high-profile one. So it's those kind of partnerships. But again, they're, they're nowhere near as, as beneficial as, uh, you know, a Western energy company coming in and, and teaching Russia how to do complex drilling or a Russian car manufacturer coming in and building a factory and manufacturing its cars there. It's just not the same kind of long-term benefit to Russia. Actually, Russia is very proud. Russian president says it's uh, very proud of restoring its car production and aviation. Are there any chances for Russia's uh, production to go back to the Soviet models where there were only Soviet cars, or only Soviet planes being produced, or like Suhoi Superjet can become probably the only plane in Russia and Moskvich uh, will be once again in uh, Russian streets? Uh, can it become true? Yeah, it's definitely a trend that Putin and lots of officials want to promote. Obviously, we saw how high profile the launch of the Moskvich car was, I think, last year. Even though when they, I think, even when they started, they could only produce a few hundred models, I think, or something that they just didn't have the, the, the capacity and they were relying a lot on Chinese cars. If you lifted it up, it was like a, basically a, almost like a Chinese car with a Russian branding and stuff on it. I think I saw some reports about. So it's definitely something Russia would like now to boost its domestic production and things like this. This was always talked about in terms of import substitution, becoming less reliant on the West, but obviously now it's become a much more fundamental drive. It, it depends, again, about where the economic priorities are, because 
you know, the most efficient and productive way is to focus on the things that your country does well and import parts from other countries that they do better. You divide production, you focus on where you value add. And that is probably the model that Russia would maybe in an ideal world, if it wasn't worried about sanctions, would like to strike with the likes of China and India, investing in car plants in particular, investing in domestic air, airplane manufacturers, airplane engines, jet engines, and stuff like that. But so there isn't really that much interest from China and India to do that. They'd probably much rather just export what they're making at home anyway uh, to keep their jobs and keep their factories at home, which basically leaves Russia relying on that kind of route that you talked about in terms of the Sovietization of its industry to protect it from sanctions. The long-term problem is it's not efficient, it's not productive. The Soviet Union found that out. So it, it, it's really unclear how productive that would be. And it comes back to all the long-term costs of sanctions and more than sanctions, the long-term costs of Russia's aggression against Ukraine is maybe we won't see the effects of this for 20 years, especially with technology. You know, For now, the technology Russia has is up to date because it was doing transfers with the West two or three years ago. But what's it going to be like in 10 years when they haven't had any transfer for a decade? You know, how much is it going to have fallen behind? And what about Russian IT sector, which the country was very proud of? We can also, well, will we see it declining or it's still one of the sectors which is holding on? It's hard to say if the sector is holding on because, of course, we all know that the IT professionals were one of the groups that were most likely to emigrate after February last year. And now the Russian IT sector is all over the world. And the Russian IT sector is kind of not really becoming the Russian IT sector anymore. If we think about what it used to be, when we think about the civilian part of the Russian IT sector, you know, companies like Yandex, Mailroof, Contacte, you know, their employees have left. They may be, in the case of Yandex and Contact, they split into international departments and Russian departments. And again, we see in Russia the militarization of this sector to a certain degree in terms of all the kind of investment in technology is coming from the government and it's coming for things that have like a military use or a military only use. And the government wants to own that. It doesn't particularly want to share that with private businesses. So It's unclear how well the civilian part of Russia's economy can do with that being the context. And again, it's really like that long-term brain drain. Lots of Russia's success in terms of its high tea industry was driven perhaps by Western investment or definitely with Western partnerships. If you look at the companies that Russia's produced, took a Yandex, for instance, even like Ozon, e-commerce platform, they had a lot of Western backers, they were listed on Western stock exchanges, they were hiring kind of people that had worked in Western companies, and that just isn't going to be the case anymore. I think I would just highlight that the Russian economy on a top line has definitely done better than predictions first thought back in February last year. But you shouldn't underestimate the degree to which the economy has been militarized, put on a wartime footing. Even if you can't see that when you look at pictures of Moscow and St. Petersburg, it's being felt much wider than that. We're seeing a very big redistribution of wealth and resources into the military economy and into parts of Russia that have never had this kind of wealth, particularly poor regions with their soldiers going to the, fight the war in Ukraine. But The longer this goes on, the more long-term economic potential Russia loses, the harder it is to get back away from a wartime footing, and the more and more like the Soviet Union the Russia economy starts to look like.